Hello, and a very warm welcome to this event in conversation with Ranjit Singh Disale, winner of the 2020 Global Teacher Prize. A particularly warm welcome to you, Ranjit. Thank you for spending time with us today. We really appreciate this opportunity to hear from you. This is the fourth year that the IOE has hosted the Varki Foundation's Global Teacher Prize lecture, which we're very proud to do as a celebration of teachers and their work. If you're in search of inspiring stories, you need look no further than the winners and runner-ups for these prizes. And this year, it is no exception. In terms of how we'll run this event, I will briefly introduce our speaker, and after that, we'll show a short video of Ranjit at his school to set the scene. Then, rather than a lecture, Ranjit's kindly agreed to, to take your questions to keep the event as interactive as possible. So please send us your questions. You can do that using the question and answer facility on Slido. You can also tweet about the event with the hashtag TeacherPrize. And can I encourage you to do that? Because we really want to spread the inspirational messages that we will hear about today. So to first introduce Ranjit. Ranjit is from Paritawadi village in the Western Peninsula region of India. The award of the Global Teacher Prize recognizes his work in transforming the life chances of children in his community by enabling them to access education. He learned the local language, translated the class textbooks and used his IT engineering skills to embed QR codes in the texts, providing access to an array of additional content. This practice was subsequently taken up across India. Ranjit also worked closely with his local community to encourage the education of girls. The Global Teacher Prize isn't Ranjit's first award as a teacher. His work has also been recognized by the Indian government and India's National Innovation Foundation. His positive messages and impetus can also be seen in his Let's Cross the Borders project, which connects young people from India and Pakistan, Palestine and Israel, Iraq and Iran and the USA and North Korea. Ranjit is of course all the more inspiring in his decision to give half of the $1 million he received from the Global Teacher Prize to his fellow finalists. A hugely generous gesture that I think we can all be humbled by. So we look forward to receiving questions from the audience. Please do um, start to upload those. But before we put the questions to Ranjit, let's take a look at his work with this short video. I just wanted to create a learning environment for every student that could spark their curiosity and make them innovative problem solvers so that they could contribute to the community. So Paritwadi is uh, mostly known for farming. So uh, we can see that all of them are below poverty level uh, parents. Boys are actually lending the helping hands to their parents. Girls' education is not given that much importance. So education is not a priority. I still remember the day one when I saw the school building and I saw that this is like indifference of a parents in looking at the education. So I started to interact with the parents, I learned their language, participated in their events. So it was like uh, being a member of their uh, community. Parantu, Jayavis Dislacer Ali, Tayavis Pasun Kaisala, Ki Ek Vidartana Prerna Miali, Ki Apan Shari Madiun, Shikla Pajit, Palkani, Tamu Kaikeloki, Justi Justi Vidartana, Shari Made, Justi or Kashiratil, Yakadil Shadilat. 
Even though I'm teaching to 12 and 13 students in a class, but everyone is learning at their own pace. I have made some QR codes on the each and every textbook. So when the students scan those QR codes, he or she gets the personalized and well curated content for himself. Considering his style of learning, I change the content at the back end. So this is how I make their learning personalized. They can challenge themselves. They are not competitors of others. Technology is helping me to bridge that gap between students living in villages and students in cities. Schools are closed, but still our teaching learning process is going on. Right now I'm running my online classes from my home. We are using some video conferencing software, so where my students could join my classes. I just make sure that they are achieving the learning outcomes of a respective class at the end of the every year. <laughs> The major issues is girls getting married at the age of 12 and 13. Girls are not uh, considered to be contributing to the family to change the status. I, I'm proud to say that in last 10 years, that culture of getting married early age was now completely banned, and I'm, I'm very happy to stop that uh, tradition. Girls' education is more than just getting them in the, in the schools. It's more about feeling safe in the community, in the society. I'm really enjoying my job. I'm being a teacher. Uh, now it's like it's my soul. It's, uh, it's my aim of life. Teachers are actually uh, catalysts that can change the society, that can really make the world a much better place that the students would like to live. Well, I feel completely inspired by that, and it's about the third time that I've seen it. But um, yeah, some, some uh, really fantastic work, and I'm sure those of you listening in feel the same, and I'm sure that's going to generate further questions. Um, and some really exciting ideas in there. The things that I've picked up, um, Ranjit, um, around the importance of community and parents, but also personalised learning, because that's something that we've thought about um, in the UK and elsewhere in the world, but but to do that well is challenging. But it's so important, isn't it, to key into um, individual um, starting points and interests, and really trying to tailor education for those children. So, I mean, I'm sure we'll come to some of those points, and I will certainly have some questions of my own as well. But but the the questions are coming in, and um, we probably ought to to, to move into that um, question and answer session. So we've got plenty of time. So um, let, let's start off with um, going right back to the beginning. And I think it would be, you know, could you tell us about how you became a teacher and how you came to work at your current school? Thank you so much, Sue, and uh, thank you so much, IOE, for inviting me to speak to you. I'm very much happy to be here today. And frankly speaking, I was not supposed to be a teacher. I was supposed to be an engineer, IT engineer. It was my dream. I did join the engineering college for six months, but somehow I couldn't make it. I had to leave it, and I came back to home. And uh, it, it was like very, I was very depressed, like, but my 
father, who was a teacher, who actually advised me, Ranjit, you have plenty of time now. Because next uh, enrollment process of the next joining the admission process of next engineering college will start in next year. So what are you going to do in those six, seven months? So it's better if you could join the teacher's training college. Just be there if you like it, then you can continue. And if you don't like it, then you can give next exam and then try for the next engineering college, another engineering college. So with the hesitated mind, I joined the teacher's training college. And then I experienced what exactly teachers can do, how they can change the life of the students. The way I'm talking now, I'm very confident. I can speak, I can communicate with anyone. But I was not like that when I joined the teacher's training college. Very shy type of a guy, very reserved person. But the teachers changed me throughout. They have filled the pure passion in me. And I like the way they were teaching, the way they were grooming me, they were developing my personality. And I was really enjoying. And considering their, you know, their efforts, I thought of, why don't I join a teacher's training college and continue my uh, uh, education to change the life of many students? Because I have experienced teachers are real change makers. So why don't I should become a real change maker? And just following that thought, I continued my education, completed that degree. Then I took, uh, I, I have to give the entrance exam to get my job. And finally, I was appointed as a teacher in know, you know, same school, Chilapurisha Primary School in Paritwadi in 2009. So this is a related journey, how I become a teacher and how I joined current school. Well, you certainly have been a change maker and um, yeah, uh, um, really uh, inspirational, I'm sure, to many of um, those who might be listening, who might be going through teacher training themselves, you know, the potential out there and the passion that you, you, you need to bring to it. And, and children, of course, are very receptive to that. So, um, yeah, okay. So um, we, we have an, a, a, another question um, from Anupama Katana, who is, I think, on the call, actually. And um, she says, the steps you took to help your pupils to access education are extremely inspiring. We would all agree with that. Um, but how difficult was it to bring about this change? Uh, what strategies did you follow to overcome these challenges? I think, you know, the strategy was very simple, very easy strategy. I, I, what I did, I tried to become a friend, a family member of the families. I shifted from my better place to Paritivati. I participated in the family programs, had a tea, had a lunch and breakfast with the families and tried to share my thoughts, my opinions and experience with them. Try to understand their culture, try to understand their mindset, how they look at the education, what they think of education, what they think of the future of their kids. And just by becoming their family member, then I try to push a thought of education, how important education is and what change education can bring. I shown them some, some like uh, idols. I invited some girls in my school, had the lectures for the parents and the girls had actually told them how important a role a girl can play in a society. And looking at the example, looking at the idol, the parents realize if that girl can do, why not mine? And the teacher is actually looking for our girls and our students. And the only thing what we need to do is just to send our kids and girls in the school. That's what that teacher is actually looking for. So this is the strategy I, I adopted. I never thought of changing their minds or pursuing or posing my 
thoughts on them because if you are trying to change something in a in a quick time i think this will not work slightly and gradually villagers in india change their mindsets they never adopt the changes in a quick time and understanding their thought process i try to convince them by the time not like in the next one year next in six months or the one month you're going to change you're going to change it's not like that so only strategy what i did what i adopted just be a member of the family convince them and try to to pursue the mindsets the way they should look at the education yeah and i i mean that's uh, uh, absolutely working in partnership with family members with parents um we know that families parents are the first educators from the moment the child is born and um so working with that and with their culture and with their perspectives uh, as partners is clearly as you've demonstrated the 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 best way to be a change maker in education and and to have that lasting sustainable impact which you clearly have a, a achieved and and will achieve even more in the future um thank you for that um and you mentioned uh, in your first uh, in the first question that you thought you'd be an engineer but of course that engineering um as expertise has really helped you um with uh, developing some of the technologies that you've used and and we have a question here about you know what gave you the idea to use qr codes embedded in those school textbooks did you try anything else or was it just a kind of instant light bulb where you thought this is what i have to do no 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 i never thought of using qr codes even when they when i saw that square mark i even i did not know this is called as qr codes i was not looking for that technology what i was doing i was just sharing the digital content that i created for my students we were sharing it through the mobile devices through the memory cards and we were facing some problems like sometimes data get corrupted sometimes mobile devices were not supporting the files that i've shared with them so we were doing something but we were facing some problems as well so what would be the better solutions i was thinking on that line one day i went to in a shop and there i saw that shopkeeper has scanned a code on a product and the information and the price was displayed on a screen and i was struck oh my god what's this happen <laughs> at the time i really didn't know this is called as qr codes that moment had to click in my mind there is something in that code that can be accessed through the any device and just letting that thought in my mind so i came back to home i just googled it but i was stuck what to search because i didn't know what to what to ask what to write so instead of having text search i tried image search on google and i asked google what is this and google told me oh this is a qr code now okay now i got it this is qr code stuff then i search how to create qr codes what we can do what can be embedded i learned everything about qr codes and there i realized this qr code will help my students to learn at home as well whatever the content i have created now that can be accessed even at home as well at early stage i created 27 qr codes for my students embedded the digital content constraining their life style of learning printed those qr codes on sticker pages and pasted it in their in the textbooks i have gone to the parents training as well how to scan the qr codes how to access the content how to give the online test then how to see the result as well such so i piloted it i did so many tests i put water on the qr codes i put tea on the qr codes what will happen because we know i'm i'm just handling kids of age 6 to 10 years old they are very naughty we know <laughs> they can tear the pages and they they will do anything that they would like to do so i don't want to uh, to anything 
could happen to my course. So I did all the tests. And finally, I realized that having the laminated QR course will really he help me and it will help my students as well. I created dynamic QR course for my students. Uh, even though I'm teaching to 27 students, but they will have different content based on their learning style. And this is the way I made learning more personalized. Even my style of learning will completely different than yours as well. So first time when students scan a QR code, he will access the digital content. It may be the video or the audio format or the PowerPoint presentation. It depends on the code. It depends on the lesson. And the next time when he scan the same QR code, he will have to give the test based on the audio video or the based on the audio content. And how much marks if he could reach out the milestone that I have set for him, then it's okay. And if he couldn't, then I will change the data at, background, at the back end. Because I really feel, personally feel that he might not have understood the concept very well. So I need to change the data so, so that he could understand the concept very well. So this is how I tried the idea of QR code in textbook. I never, frankly, I never thought of it. Brilliant. I mean, what a fantastic, innovative uh, way to go about things. And particularly, I think at the moment when we're working in such um, restricted uh, conditions within education. But we'll perhaps come back to that a bit later because we've had a couple of questions about working within a, a COVID uh, situation. But, but uh, I have a, another question here um, about teaching more broadly. And and the question is, what advice would you give to anyone who is considering teaching as a career? <laughs> I think if, you, if you're pursuing uh, teaching as a career, if you're thinking teaching as a career, try to be a teacher of 21st century. Yeah. It is said that the students of 21st century are being taught by teachers of 20th century using that 19th century curriculum with 18th century techniques. So world needs teachers of 21st century, teachers who are well equipped, well comfortable to use the technology in a meaningful way that could lead to the authentic learning. Teachers should adopt student-centric approaches in the classrooms. Those who are thinking teaching as a career, be compassionate, be sensitive. Because students like a teacher who loves them, who take care of them, who is not shouting at them, who is not always looking at the mistake what they have made. So you have to be very, very kind to your students. You have to be very patient as well. You have to keep your patience. So if you're thinking teaching as a career, don't forget these qualities should have been you have today. Well, they certainly resonate with um, my experience of teaching and I, I am a primary school teacher by training uh, many years ago, of course, but uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and I guess that, um, you know, you mentioned that this age group can be uh, quite challenging sometimes, maybe wanting to do very creative things with QR codes or whatever it might be. And of course, we want to find opportunities for that. And I think the, way, the reason that the personalized uh, learning has, has, has been so powerful and hearing you speak about that is because we know that in certain parts of the world, of course, the curriculum and pedagogy has been become more and more restricted. And that's a real pressure for teachers to deliver certain outcomes that may not be uh, tailored to the children's needs. So I think there are pressures in the teaching profession globally to deliver uh, certain, certain outcomes. And I, I think we've got to hang on to the messages that you're giving around um, remembering the child is there at the center um, with the family and the teacher working to help them achieve things. So I think that's come, really, come through really clearly um, in, in your video and in your, your answer. So can I, can I come then to the kind of COVID situation that we're all in at the moment, but obviously different parts of the world experiencing it very differently. 
Um, and um, we've had a question and I had a question also about how has this affected your school and the local community, but also what have you had to do to adapt to these circumstances and to continue to offer education for your children? Actually, you know, we were ready for these type of situations because, as I told you, girls who were not attending schools, they were still learning at home. So we were some sort of like, we were well prepared for this. But the only thing was that earlier, the online teaching was happening occasionally, right? But during the pandemic, we have shifted from face-to-face -face teaching to completely on a different mode. Uh, complete, we shifted from online face-to-face uh, to, -face to online mode. And uh, students at the beginning were facing some problems like technical glitches were there because in the classrooms, I was supporting them. If they were facing some problems, I was lending a helping hand to them. But during the pandemic, it was really difficult for me. Second thing was that access of technology and availability of devices was also the concern for me as well. But fortunately, I took help from many donors, from my friends who actually donated their mobile devices, old mobile devices for my students. And somehow I could manage at least a single device is available for the students in a family. And uh, looking, looking at the availability of all the devices and technology, I manage every student or so every family should have a mobile devices that could be used for educational purpose only. And if you look at the strategy or if you just look at the teaching method adopted during the pandemic, I never focused on completing the curriculum, teaching them the license and other things. During the pandemic, I more focused on teaching them life, life skills, developing their 21st century skills like critical thinking, decision-making, creativity. I designed some projects, innovative projects, like sitting at home, students were measuring how much water they have used today how much electricity was consumed today, what was the temperature of their city or their village, and they were making a note in their observation seat. And we were having a meeting at weekend, everyone was coming with their own observation seat. And I asked them, now just look at your observation seat and try to find out when temperatures increases by one degree, how much water increases, how much uses of water increases, how much electricity you use more than earlier. So this actually, when they collected the data, now analyze it. It's very important, analyzing the data as well. And based on the analysis, now they made a decision, they made a plan of action. They knew how much water they have in the village. And they made a plan of action this water can be used till June or July or August. And if unfortunately, if rain could rain, it, it could have rained, then what we need to do, it's like plan B. So students themselves realize the importance of water, importance of preventing the nature. And I more focus on designing such projects for my students because I realize Nature and the family were the safest source of knowledge for my students during the pandemic. And I just took help of nature and family so that they could play a role of a teacher. Not like the traditional teacher, but every family member had certain amount of different knowledge. They have a source of knowledge and information experience, how they can share it with their kids, how students can learn from the nature. And this is what I did during the pandemic. Well, fantastic to use that local knowledge, community knowledge, knowledge in families 
and work with that rather than trying to press on with some kind of formal curriculum. Um, of course, there have been some real losses in the teaching exchange by being remote working. And I think we're all struggling with that because we know that the, some of the best learning moments are in that interaction between teacher and child or between children. Is that, uh, how, how, what can we do about the kind of the social interaction and the, the well-being of our, of our children across the world who are learning remotely now? Is, is, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I I personally miss my students. We were hugging, we were dancing, sharing tippings with them. We did, we have so much fun in the classrooms. You know, when we are having face-to-face classroom. Yeah, it's it's really difficult to go through the online process. Or uh, since last uh, ten or eleven months, and considering the well-being, social being, uh, online method how to behave well on the, on the online classes. It's, it was really tough job for teachers because teachers were not trained for the online teaching. They have been trained for the face-to-face -face teaching. They have been taught how to engage students physically in the classrooms. So this pandemic has taught us now we need to create or we need to develop a teaching role that could adopt that could change the strategies, the way we have responded in the pandemic. So our response, if we as a teachers, our response should not be the same for the next pandemic. So we should be well prepared for the next pandemic as well. We need to adopt new technological skills. We need to develop our teaching method as relative to the 21st century. So this pandemic has taught a lot to us as well as a teacher. Absolutely. And in, in similar, but also in different ways, we are learning in the UK about this. It has surfaced many inequalities uh, uh, for children in different uh, home situations, different access to technology. Um, I think globally, do, um, I hope you agree that, that we need to share the good practices that we are um, developing and be better prepared and build resilience in our children and also skills and in parents and our teachers um, to address this. Um, yeah, it's really good to hear about some of the examples that you've been using and I'm sure that will be inspiring for many of our listeners. So I'm going to move us on now to the girls in education um, because that was quite a uh, a, a, an important part of your video and your work. And I think there is quite a lot of interest in, in that aspect and of course, um, hugely important. So I'll just, I'll just read you this question as it's come in. So where do politics um, in terms of the power structures in family or community or at a national level, um, how, how does wanting girls to go to school and work, how does that impinge on, on your work? I mean, how have you uh, tackled that very difficult issue? And clearly you've made a lot of progress in that, but it, obviously it comes from quite a political perspective. Uh, it may be political, but you know, in the, within the family, um, as I told you at the beginning of my school year in, in, as a teacher in 2009, and I actually surveyed the village. And I, I, I collected the data like about the educational status of villagers, economical status, their culture, their regional background. And there I found out interesting fact. And the women in the village were more educated as compared to the males. And I thought I should take a help of female, maybe the mothers of my students, will the mothers understand much better than her father. Kids are very close to their mother. And I decided to take a help of women, especially the mothers, in a teaching learning process at home. 
I was not more focusing on the tradition because they were thinking girls are made for others, not for our family. Girls are born for other families. So what we need to do, we just raise her and get it to her family, just married her like this. This was their attitude. But what I did, I took a help of mothers and started a campaign community engagement program. That program actually helped me to create awareness among the parents about girls' education. Girls' education is not just about getting them in the classroom. It's more about unleashing their potential, thinking of how they can contribute to the community, how they can con contribute to their family as well. So initiatives like Alarm on TV Off helped me a lot. I had set up an alarm on my school building. And that alarm rings at 7 p.m. every night. So this is a clearly indication for parents. Now you have to stop whatever you're doing. Just turn off your mobile phones and television, or whatever you're doing. Now sit together with your, with your kids. And now help him in his homework or what, he's, what he did in the classroom. But as the parents were completely unaware what to do, so I started to send a text message at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. So in the afternoon, they realized this is my role. Today, tonight, I have to do the, the, the things and my kid is going to do, do the, 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 the sort of things. So, so trial of teacher, parent, and student actually helped me to bring the girls in a, in a school to teach them a much better way and brighten their future. So I, I'm not only a, a person who actually bring this change. I think it's a collective effort. Community helped me, parents helped me, and the girls also helped me. Well, that sort of um, leads me into the next question because what you've described is is clearly working really well in your school, in your community. But how typical is your school, um, if you're thinking about rural India and other parts? And, and then I suppose the second part is, is this something you want to take more widely? Um, so how typical is, is the way you're working at the moment? It's a typically like, it's, it's a typically village school in India. Uh, if you just look at the Indian uh, uh, villagers, the economic status, uh, mostly they will live in below poverty level of their standards. And uh, considering their educational status, maybe mostly they might have completed primary education. So looking at the education, the, the glasses looking at the educations, we may say negligible. They never thought of education can bring the changes in their life. And uh, it's typically uh, school like government school. So it's, it's more of a like lack of infrastructure, lack of inspiration for teachers as well. And uh, more focus on the administrative work, not on the academic work, not on the progress of students. So teachers were doing more academic uh, administrative work rather than teaching and academic performance of the students. So it's very typical Indian school where I'm teaching. But the work you're doing, and obviously that in itself is innovative and has, uh, as a change maker, you have uh, obviously taken the school in different directions. And uh, is, is that something that can be uh, taken more widely and, and how might you do that now uh, to influence how education develops more widely across your country? I think, yeah, this model that I've developed in my school now can be replicated across the country. Because we can see so many schools, government schools, like mine as well. 
So typically like parents' indifference towards education, teachers feel lacking of inspiration, um, more doing more administrative work. So what I did, what are the changes I've brought? Now this model can be replicated, but I, I just think it's more about policy makers, decision makers, they should now look at this. I, as a teacher, cannot do this. It's, it's their job. If they feel, oh, this model can be replicated, I'm more happy to help them to replicate this model across the state and across the country. And I'm sure that um, uh, winning this prize is, is going to give you the profile that will enable you to do that and, and make your work, your work widely known. I'm, I have every confidence that it will be very influential, um, not just in India, but, but across the globe, of course. Um, so, so how does it feel to be an ambassador for the teaching profession internationally, uh, which you are now, and, uh, and, and fantastic to, to see that? Um, how does it feel? <laughs> It, it feels like being valued and understood as an educator. I always feel Even uh, you, you call me as an ambassador, but basically more than I am a teacher, a teacher who is a lifelong learner, who actually try to learn so many things uh, any time. So even though I'm biggest advocacy of technology and more try to create more innovators in the classrooms, but moreover, I uh, would like to work for my students uh, rather than, you know, having a member of any community committee and like a policy makers like this. So I even becoming an ambassador of education, but I'm more interested in teaching in the classrooms, engaging with students, interaction with students. It's really, really, um, interesting for me as well and happy moments because I bring that happiness in the classrooms every day and I always like to see happy faces smiling students smiling at me so I'm more and more selfish to see the happy faces yeah I mean that's great to know because uh, you know that is where you can make the biggest change of course with those children who come through your school uh, and I'm sure there'll be other ways that your ideas and your work can be influential uh, and you can be an ambassador, but still be uh, with the children in the classroom. Um, uh, we have a question here about the awards that you've won. And clearly you have, this is not the first, as, as we've, we've said. But, but what is, can you tell us about some of the proudest moments in your teaching career? I mean, there were some, so many proudest moments, but one thing that I would like to mention here, Sakshi, one of my students, when she came to school and told me, sir, today I got a job. I completed my engineering and I got a job and I'm not working and I'm more or I'm earning money. Oh my God, I was really happy. Because I still remember the day one when Sakshi arrived in school and her parents were actually beating her. They were very, very angry at her. Because she was crying, I want to go to school, I want to go to school. But parents were having completely different mindsets. They don't want her school, her, her kid or girl to go to school. They want Sakshi to live at home and take care of their, her little brothers and sisters. But Sakshi was really confident to determine. And after working very hard, she managed to get a job. And this means a lot to that family. Yeah. So she became an engineer. That was my actual dream. <laughs> but she completed her dream. I couldn't complete mine, but she completed. And she's now pursuing, or she's now having a job in Bangalore, working in a international company and she speak English very well than me. So it's a really proudest moment for me as a teacher. Fantastic example there. And I'm sure teachers listening in will, will really understand that when you see an impact and the, the positive outcome. But that's a particularly uh, poignant case of, of how you've changed the life uh, of one of your pupils. Um, 
we've had quite a lot of questions. We've had lots of comments saying congratulations on your amazing work and how much people are enjoying hearing you speak. Um, I've got a specific question here to say a little bit more. I think we have touched on it a bit, but a little bit more about the role of affectivity, I suppose the kind of personal emotional side of um, learning and in the teaching process. We did touch on it in the relation to COVID, of course, we know that's been a concern, but maybe more generally, uh, can you say something about the importance of that in, in teaching? Yeah, teachers cannot be neutral in classrooms while engaging, interacting with students. It's not like their role is not just about completing the syllabus, teaching them the lessons and other things. It's more about nurturing a good human beings. So students represent the culture of their respective family. They come up with that mindset. They come up with that culture in the classroom. And our classroom becomes diverse classrooms. So each and every student represents their family and every family has their different culture. So teachers has to tackle this diverse classroom considering the changes and outcomes that you want to bring. So outcomes cannot be calculated in terms of marks and digits and figures. It can be calculated, the result can be seen in terms of its own appearance in the society. We might have seen, even I saw, so many uneducated people were behaving more wisely than the educated people. I have seen this example during the pandemic. Government had instructed us to wear masks and villagers, uneducated people were just following the instructions, wearing the mask. But the educated people, they were refusing. Mask is not going to work. I think education actually fails there. We have educated them, but haven't told them how to behave in the society, how to take care of our whole health as well and the community as well. So social well-being actually starts in the classroom and then later on it passes in the community. So the way teacher engage, the way he interacts with students in the classroom, students listens, see him, and try to adopt his behavior. And they then take it in the society. So it's like students are representative of teachers' well-being and social behavior in the classroom. They like to adopt it, and they represent it in the, in the community. So I think social well-being of teacher plays an important role in the, in the classrooms, irrespective, it may be online classroom or face-to-face -face classroom. Thank you. I mean, that's uh, a really full answer, actually, just thinking about the kind of relationships you build with learners, the, the, the need to be caring, but also to guide sometimes and to good, be a good role model. I mean, the teacher's role is incredibly complex in that way. And... Um, um, I think all of us as teachers feel a huge responsibility uh, for helping the next generation to develop into, you know, great citizens. Um, and so I think we are, if we're not careful, in danger of losing that social and if affective dimension to education if we go down this very narrow route that is all about learning outcomes and achievements. And it's really good to hear you speaking in this way passionately because I know that myself and many others absolutely agree with you there. Um, we're getting more and more questions in, but actually we're, we've probably only got time for a couple more, but I'll just have a look and see what we've got. Um, okay, I think this is quite, quite a good one, actually. Um, what do you think would help to make more teachers feel like change makers? Um, within their own classroom and beyond. So I think some advice about, you know, you're obviously inspiring everyone to make changes, but, but how can they do this? If you want to change, if you want to become a change maker, 
First thing is that change yourself. It, it is always a charity begins at home. So if you want to become a change maker, I think my first advice would be teachers should adopt the changes within the within the own personality. Try to be a friend of your students. Try to behave like them. Love them a lot. It's not like changes always can be measured in 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 terms of the academic performance. It's more about their their personality, their behavior in the society as well. So if you want to become a real change maker, my advice will be just just change yourself and this process of changing yourself will take you through that process of changing others and becoming a real change maker in the classroom. It's not like a, a set of instructions. If you just follow these steps, you become a real change maker. It's not like that. Experience that change in your personality. And that change, that process of changing yourself will, will teach you how to become a real change maker in the classrooms. That's what I think. Thank you. That's really, really helpful and inspiring, I'm sure. We're probably coming to the last questions before I sum up. And um, there's a question really about next steps. What are your plans? I think we'd all love to hear about what you do after this. Um, are you going to scale things up? Are you going to, you've already said you want to stay close to the classroom. But um, yeah, what, what are your next, next your plans for the future? Yeah, that's a good question. I would always like to appeal teachers who, who are actually looking for my next step, what I'm going to do next. Actually, I'm going to find out so many Ranji display in India. I know there are so many excellent teachers doing excellent job in the respective classroom. I'm going to find them. I'm going to build a nature of, of innovative teachers. And the positive energy of all the teachers will help us to change the pace of education system in India. I'll be more willing to work with government to, to initiate, to pitch my ideas. What I did in the past with the, with the idea of QR code textbook and other projects, I would like to see these projects scaled up across the state and across the country so that the work the other teachers are doing can be scaled up and we can bring this change in the education system of India. But Ranjit is not capable of doing that. So I need to look more and more Ranjit display in India. So I'm going to do that. And looking at the international aspect, as I told you, I have shared 50% prize money with my fellow panelists. So I'm thinking of building some international projects with them. How I can support the education system and how I can support all these nine teachers to bring the changes what I did in my classroom, the changes I brought in my classrooms. So we all 10 teachers will working together to change the face of educational system across the globe as well. So we will work as a team, not as an individual. I more believe together we can make change. We can bring the changes. So if you all who are listening, I'll be, I'm appealing you, participate in our global projects whenever we'll be starting them and bring the changes what we did in our classrooms. I would like to see the same changes in your classrooms. So I'm more interested in collaboration work, joining my hands with you. So collective efforts of all the teachers in, in, the, in the world will really give all the students a birthright of education, not just education, but quality education. 
Well, Ranjit, that, thank you for that. And, and I was going to ask, you know, how can we connect all of us here? Um, what do you need from us? How can we help take this forward? Um, I hope you will keep in touch with us, but you've, you've said that you hope that you can connect with the global teaching profession and, and, and partners, and I think that, that's wonderful. Um, is there anything uh, that people can get in touch or will there be some um, uh, a way of contacting the network when it's set up? I mean, um, what, what should people yeah. be looking out for? If you want to connect me, you can just follow me on Twitter, or Insta, or Facebook. Uh, on the social platform, I, I more share my new projects and appeal the teachers. I made a group of Facebook teachers and Twitter on, on the Twitter as well. Just follow me on Twitter and Facebook and Insta. They will find out my new announcement, what I'm doing, what I'm asking for parents and teachers and students. So just be in touch through the social media. Thank you. I've just got a few words to say before we close. Um, but just to uh, note that uh, you're in your school at the moment, I think. Is that right? I was in his school. But right now I'm in, in my home. You're in your home and it's about 8.30 in the evening? Yes. About and you've been, uh, you must be, uh, you've had a very long day, I'm sure. And I don't know how you find time to do all of this. Do you ever <laughs> sleep? Um, but I just want to, I'm going to start by... Um, saying my, my warm congratulations to you on behalf of everybody on the call, everybody at the IOE and the global teaching community, because we are a community and I think at heart we all have the same aspirations and we need to try and join that up and, and be a powerful voice. And you've been brilliant at setting out a great vision and some brilliant examples of what can be achieved. And uh, we're very grateful to you for, for, for that, Ranjit. It's really inspirational. I feel really inspired and um, I will follow your work with interest. And I really hope that you stay connected to the IOE because uh, many of the issues you've raised um, are very close to our heart. So um, it's, it's such a pleasure to host this event and to hear you speak. Uh, so thank you for coming along to talk today. We've heard a lot about um, innovation and what can be achieved. We've heard about the role of school uh, for, for education and, and girls. We've heard about personalized learning relationships, the importance of social and emotional. Uh, it's been so rich. It's been absolutely brilliant. So um, you are a change maker. You are an ambassador. And um, I hope you really enjoy your uh, success and your award. And you'll go from strength to strength to pass the message on but please stay in touch. It's been an absolute pleasure to meet you. And I hope we can meet again. Um, who knows, even in the same place, wouldn't that be something? But it's been great, great to meet you. So, I, so th sorry, yeah, please. I, it's like on the, on, at the end of this session, I, I think we should not forget the Waki Foundation because they yes. have been celebrating teaching. Indeed. Celebrating the teachers. So we should thank them, Tim Waki. And Indeed. Susana. Who has been really working for teachers. So I must say thank to them on this platform and we will stay connected. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we uh, are also very well connected to Varki. We will work together and continue uh, with this wonderful prize. So, so thank you, Ranjit, and um, I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Yeah. And, you are. and thank you, everybody, for listening in today.